And now I want to have our keynote speaker, our keynote guest. Uh, he's the host of The Prophet on CNBC. He does a dozen different things. I can't even list them because it'll take like 10 minutes. We're going to ask him how he actually manages to do all that stuff. But I'm really happy to have here today Marcus Lemonis. Marcus, come on up. The Prophet, ladies and gentlemen. What's up, buddy? Come on in. <laughs> Marcus, thank you so much for being here today. And I know that you normally ch charge a big fee for, uh, you know, for, for speaking, and I appreciate you waiving that for us, because as a news organization, we, we can't pay people to speak. Yeah. So we're happy to have you here today. One of the things that uh, I first wanted to ask you, you know, I own a business, and I, I wake up, and I'm working on the business. I go to sleep, I'm working on the business. You, a lot of people don't know this, but you made a fortune. I mean, you still are making a fortune as the owner and operator of the largest ca camping uh, uh, RV business. retail, RV business, retail business for RVs and campsites across the country. And, uh, but that's just your sort of the things that pay you to have a lot of fun with your other stuff. You recently became somebody that Overstock and Bed Bath & Beyond wanted to make a CEO. You have a production company, which I want to get into that because it's amazing what, yeah. how you go about TV shows and how you produce them. A lot of people don't realize how he, he puts his shows on TV, which is very interesting. But how do you manage all the stuff that you do? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, I'm happy to be in Miami. I'm a Miami guy, so 305. Uh, for those Columbus guys in the room, I'm also a Columbus guy, so proud to represent my high school. Um, you know, business for me uh, is um, probably, other than my wife, the most important thing that I do. And I don't really think about the transactions of it all. I think about the, the relationships of it all. And my camping business, Camping World, I've had for 20 years. It's a big business, uh, a very real estate intensive where there's 220 sites. Uh, we probably have well over a couple billion dollars of real estate. And, um, you know, I go from something like that to a now a recent um, uh, investment and involvement in Overstock, Bed Bath & Beyond. Mm -hmm. And as I think about uh, business in general, it's really trying to learn and to understand. The one reason that I came today uh, is because I look at real estate and you and I have talked about this before, but I look at real estate as the single greatest asset to create generational wealth for every single person in this room, for not only themselves, but more importantly, the people that you're working for. And what I mean that is your kids, your grandkids for generations to come. And I think as a society in, uh, in general, we don't necessarily pay enough attention to how real estate is that single tool that can change somebody's life. Obviously, you have to have an appropriate measure of how to leverage that asset. And I mean leverage in terms of put debt on top of it. We're living in an environment where rates are fluctuating at a very fast rate, and our cash flows weren't necessarily prepared for them. Um, but you know, real estate for me, ultimately, and the reason that I love being at events like this is I see it as the gateway to true wealth more than anything else. Do you, do you consider uh, Camping World USA to be more of a real estate business or do you consider it to be a, actually an RV and uh, yeah. you know, it's auto great. That's actually a great question. So years ago when I started the business 20 years ago, I never looked at real estate as something that I wanted to park my cash into. And so I would utilize four or five different REITs, triple N, realty income, all the big REITs that are out there. And the cap rates were decent. You're talking about cap rates from 6 to 7.5%, depending on the time that you do it. Over time, as our credit improved and our balance sheet improved, I started to look at ways to, to um, mask working capital. And, and as a company is building its cash profile, you can use real estate as a place to park your money. And I'm getting, essentially, the same return on it that I, would, that I would be, was being charged. So it's a good return on capital. Over time, I used that, uh, that, that revolver to bring real estate in, to let that location mature, to ensure that it's going to work because I want to have maximum flexibility. And then after it reaches a certain coverage 
on the rent side, uh, I then uh, do a sale lease back, get the cash back, and then almost go back and find a new property. So I use it as a, I use it differently than I used to. You also, your businesses are all so varied, right? You, yeah. I recently, I got a gift box from you with different soda pops yeah. and things like that. And you know, you're involved with the home goods store and you have the production house. How do you become, and you, you know, you are the prophet, which yeah. is a great uh, title, but how do you become an expert in these, uh, in these different businesses? How do, you be, how do you all of a sudden understand what yeah. the pitfalls are and the nuances? I think that the single biggest thing about being an investor in lots of different businesses is having this acute self-awareness and recognition that you are not an expert in anything. And that ultimately for a business to succeed, you have to really understand that you're going to part with some of your equity and some of your cash to attract people that are subject matter experts. I typically like to invest in businesses that I believe in, that I have fun with, but I also want to make sure that I don't invest in something where I don't believe that I have somebody in the room, more than one person, that's infinitely smarter than me on that particular that business. You place them there though. Either I place them there or I recognize them as worthwhile to invest in. And a lot of times, and there's people in this room today that have what it takes to, to be the biggest developer in the world, but they may not have the access to capital. They may not have the access to lending. And when we look at the lending market today, and for those women in the room, it's hard to be a, a woman in business. It's hard to get acknowledgement from banks. It's hard to be a person of color in business. And so I really built, uh, much, to, much to, to my wife's credit, started to build the deployment of my capital, of our capital, into folks that didn't necessarily have access to the same capital. I see every kind of proposal that you would imagine in terms of investing. And really the first filter for me is, do they have the ability to access capital from somebody other than me? And if they do, I always tell them to do that because mine's going to potentially be, you know, it'll have some strings attached. It'll be more expensive. It'll have some oversight. I'm not just going to give you money and hope it works out. But I do look for people that I believe have a lot of integrity, a lot of drive, and they truly are subject matter experts, but they haven't been given the access to but They capital. must welcome your expertise they in don't, terms of usually. managing operating now, businesses. Usually what happens is, and for those folks that are in the fundraising business, uh, you always will tell the investor everything they want to hear before you get the check. And there's this really bizarre idea around amnesia that most times once you invest in people, they, you know, they sometimes forget like what the rules of engagement are. Over time, I've learned uh, through probably 50 million, five zero, 50 million of losses that I needed to not be as trusting, that I needed to paper things more. Unfortunately, while I know that intellectually, still today when I invest, it's really just about a handshake and a relationship. And if you end up taking advantage of that, that's on you, that's not on me. You know, you also have a lot of fun with it. I mean, I don't know. I, yeah. I'm guessing the RV business is not that exciting and fun. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's making you a lot of money, so that yeah. part is awesome. But the, the part that, um, you know, I, you, had, you went ahead and did this experimental thing where you went and there was a town in bankruptcy in the middle of America. Yeah. You went and bought this town and you bought all the assets within the town and as an experiment, you were like, I want to turn this town around and uh, yeah. you know, bring, bring water to the town, as they yeah. say. Let's, yeah, let's talk about that. So, you know, I'm a big believer that everybody uh, is looking for an opportunity. I was born in a foreign country. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, grew up here in Miami. And for those of you that have been in Miami your whole life, this is the land of opportunity, sometimes even more than most other places. It's also the land of relationships. And for me, business is really about relationships. And uh, I was on the internet one day, and the mayor of a town um, was um, uh, trying to put a 79-year-old war veteran in jail. And he hadn't tuck pointed his building. And the 79-year-old veteran didn't have the $4,000 required to do it, so they fined him and they told him they were gonna put him in jail. I wrote the guy uh, something on social media and I said, listen, if you put that guy in jail, we're gonna have a problem. I'll pay the guy's bill, but I also wanna have a chance to come to the town. 
in a matter of like 18 months, I had bought, I think, 14 or 15 properties on this small little main street. And I met with the entire town. I think there was maybe like six or 700 people in a gymnasium one night. And I said, listen, I'm willing to put my money into your town with zero expectation of a return. I don't, I'm not here to make money. I'm here to prove that if you put some effort and you get out the bucket of water and you cut the grass and you paint the building and you actually give a shit about what it is that's happening around you, people will do things for you. And so what I did is I created this whole plan and I told them, if you do these things as a community over the next 12 months, I will give you every piece of real estate that I bought into the foundation wow. so that the town could own it. But I was dead serious about the fact that I had this expectation that I wanted them to clean their streets, clean their garbage, paint their town, open up businesses. I ended up uh, providing working capital for people to open their business. And I, I, I've never been back to the town since. You haven't gone back? No, because they did everything that I asked them to do, and the town is thriving, and they have a different attitude today. And so if you are in real estate, uh, which I assume most of you are, I really believe that real estate says a lot about our community. I used to never be permitted to walk around Wynwood when I was a kid. It wasn't an area that you came and hang out at. You'd, your parents would never let you. You would never go into the, what is now known as the Miami Design District. You would never walk into Overtown. You just wouldn't do it. Liberty City. Today, I'm proud that, that this community has invested in those types of things. And every city in America, every one of you, comes from a city that has those kinds of things. If you are a wealthy individual, in my opinion, you have an obligation, and a lot of people don't like this, to reinvest that money into the community that actually gave you the platform to make your money. And, and my, theory, my theory around money is a little different. Everybody in this room makes money uh, their own way. And you work your butt off and you take chances and you've, you've earned every penny. I'm a capitalist, you're a capitalist. But I also look at money as borrowed money. And the money that I've accumulated is essentially money that I've worked hard for, I've created businesses, but I'm just borrowing it. And my responsibility is to turn that money into a working asset so that the next person that touches that money has an opportunity to do the same for the next folks as well. And so my, my, my theory is I have no kids, uh, my parents are gone, um, I have no brothers and sisters, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, my hope is that my last check bounces, and uh, I either give it to Columbus, or I give it to the communities that, I, that have made me who I am today. In reference to the... In reference to the town that you bought, uh, so basically you brought an HOA to the, to the town, yeah. and basically that's, that's essentially what you did. And you said you never went back, but I mean, you obviously invested a lot of money there. there was, it was a significant amount of money. It was like four, I'm, I'm not minimizing, it was like four or five million dollars. Yeah. But for me, for that town to now have a bright future instead of closing, which is really what I thought was happening to a lot of towns around this country, is that we sort of move on, you know, as, as, as humans, we like new shiny objects. And when we get bored of one thing, we move on to the next. And the reality of it is, is that our grandparents and our great grandparents worked and created an environment that needs to be up, up, up kept. And I think the biggest problem today is that I don't believe young people, and I say this with conviction, necessarily understand, in some cases, not all, how hard it is to make a dollar and how hard it is to turn that dollar into something else. And so that, that's why I love real estate because it's really hard to screw up. It's hard to screw up? Really hard. We, we cover people who screw it up every it's day. It's really hard to screw it up. There, you know, you, you also mentioned the term uh, altruistic, cap you're an altruistic capitalist, yeah. which is sort of an oxymoron in some ways, or some people would consider it to be oxymoron. Yeah. Well, is, that, is that what you mean when you say altruistic capitalist? Yeah, like so I, I have no problem admitting publicly that I'm a capitalist to my core, but the idea behind making money, I think, has been demonized too much. You, if you make a lot of money, you're a bad person. If you make a lot of money, you did it the wrong way. And the reality of it is, is that that's not true. If you make a lot of money, you should be credited with 
being intelligent and being at the right place in the right time, having a lot of luck. However, I look at business as a privilege and not a right. And with that privilege, I get to have lots of people work for me. I get to have lots of families that I can affect. And the reason I say altruistic capitalism is because before my mother passed away, she said to me one thing. You have the ability to make a lot of money, but what will make me proud is what you do with that money. And your ability to change the world, to change other people's outlooks on the world, to give people an opportunity that otherwise would not, is essentially doing for them what I did for you. And when I flew over to Beirut, Lebanon to pick your sorry ass up and bring you back here, I had an expectation that you were going to make me proud by taking your intelligence and what I gave you and giving that to other people. It doesn't mean that you can't be the most aggressive negotiator. It doesn't mean that you can't figure out a way to come in the side door and smash glass and be an amazing business person. She would always tell me, be the best, be first, work harder, do all these things. But the fruits that you yield from that work, that's ultimately what I care about. You know, I love the fact that, uh, we, you know, we, we were talking about your new show, The Renovator, right? Yeah. Uh, Marcus has a new show called The Renovator. I don't know how new it is, it's less than a year old. And, uh, you know, you've done a lot of different TV shows and you had this idea about doing The Renovator. And, uh, you know, you went to these different channels and they didn't want to put the money for it to do the actual renovations. Yeah. And then I, I love the fact that you bridged the gap from A yeah. to B. Yeah, let's talk cut. about that. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, um, uh, home design, home renovation shows are everywhere. You can turn on every channel in America. And I think they're meant to inspire consumers to buy the products and services that all of us create, right? They're, they're meant to do that. I think the challenge is, is that when you watch television, you're given the impression that something is happening. And in every television show around home renovation, there's this happy moment in the end where everybody is super excited because they have their new home. And as I dug into how the production was working for those kinds of shows, I started to learn that in most cases, <clears throat> it was relatively staged. In my show, The Profit, I was adamant with CNBC that the actual result of the business, good or bad, was going to be what happened. If the people screwed me, you saw it. If I made a bad decision, you saw it. If I made money, you saw it. And that didn't happen much. But what, what really happened, you had to see. And when I started doing this home show, the reason that I did it is because I truly believe that dysfunction in business is established because of dysfunction at home. And ultimately, I wanted to make this point that if you wanted to fix people and the way they thought about how they interacted with others and how they thought about money, you have, you have to start with how they think about their family and where they live. When people don't take care of their property, they ultimately, for me, don't respect money. And I remember the first thing that I ever bought that gave me joy was I spent $267,550 buying my first home. It was on 5074 Great Oak Lane. And I got a mortgage for, uh, I, I went into a countrywide mortgage. I paid a ridiculous rate. I had P&I insurance because I didn't have a down payment. And I had $9,500 as my down payment. And it was the scariest thing in my life. And people always ask me why I remember that so much. My first real estate acquisition was my proudest moment because I thought that this was something that was going to set me free. And so for all of you that are in the residential or commercial real estate business who take it for granted today because you have 100 properties or your, your billion dollar development or some big building, I always want to ask you to do one thing and take yourself back to your first acquisition, the first deal that you did where you didn't have two nickels to rub together, where you were begging the banker to give you the loan, where you borrowed money from your sister and your mother to get the down payment to buy that asset. And you sit here today as a very successful real estate investor with sometimes the forgetfulness of how you got here. And so that is my biggest request. And when I made the home show, it was to remind Americans of what the joy and jewel is to do that. The problem that I had is that I found out that most home shows are kind of bullshit. They renovate a few things. 
They stage the home, and then they leave, and the show's over. And then the truck comes in, and it takes all their stuff. Oh my God. And my wife and I, when we were on the show, because we did the show together, uh, said to each other, like, there's no universe where we're going to take these deserving families, and then we're just going to, like, leave. So we would go out, and we would go to Bed Bath & Beyond. No joke. This is kind of a full circle moment. Uh, we, we would go to Bed Bath & Beyond, and we would spend, like, $100,000 and we would fill these homes and we would tell the homeowners, hey, everything you see here is because you didn't act like an idiot. You took our advice. You were nicer to your husband or nicer to your kids. You changed the things that you were doing and this is our gift to you. The reason that I decided to essentially take over Bed Bath & Beyond today and I went onto the board about three weeks ago is because, Let me just give a little preface. Yeah. So about three weeks ago, uh, Marcus joined the board of uh, Overstock and Bed Bath and & Beyond, yeah. and there was a, a big rumor that he was going to be their next CEO of, uh, of Bed Bath & Overstock. No, not, not that's not happening. But, so but, give, us, give us some but, news. But the reason that I did that is because Bed Bath & Beyond was the only company that would give me a discount when I was buying these things for these families. And they started to donate a bunch of things. And quite frankly, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. And they ended up going into bankruptcy. And I made it my mission to figure out how to get involved in a business and a brand that helped me and those families when nobody else would. And so it seems a little crazy, but. And you also, you, you had some sort of an agreement with HGTV that, you know, regardless, you're going to put up the money. And, yeah. uh, it, you know, they don't have to back it up but that if the show started to make money, that yeah. you would make so, your money. Uh, so when you and I did that interview, I was doing the show at HGTV, and I pulled the show from HGTV, and I'm going to launch the first long-form television program ever at X okay. with them. And so it's a project to really democratize media in a very different way, and so we'll see what so happens. You're going to do a long-form show on X. Uh, yeah, it'll be the first long-form. Do you get a much larger audience, obviously? Well, it's, it's for me, um, you know, not everybody has access to things, and so what I love about X is that it's essentially free access to information. And the one thing that I love doing is democratizing intelligence, democratizing experience, and democratizing information. And the one reason that you and I have a nice relationship, and I was very honest with you from the beginning, is because the purpose of the real deal, and I say this not to embarrass him, but I mean this to my core, is to provide people like us the resources and the information to improve our own lives. And you are obligated, because you have people invested, to make profit. But at the end of the day, you do it because you saw white space, and you saw all of us having a void of information, and you provide us with information so we make less stoop, we suck less. Well, you know, the funny thing is, well, we don't have investors, thank God. Your, your wife is not an investor? No, I'm not married, but... Oh. Uh, but uh, is was, your landlord an investor? Was, but no, we bought our office space. Do you have a bank? If we have a bank. That's your investor. investor there he is. Okay. No, but I consider our readers our investors, and, you know, we always tell the team that, uh, you know... Do you want any investors? Readers, <laughs> no, we always say, read, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years, and we always said rule number one is readers first, right? Like, as, as long as we can serve the readers, then we've done our job. And so that's always been a priority for us, and we've always kept to that for 20 years. I want to just address your I don't have investors, okay? Because I think you, you did a nice job at the end of cleaning that up. Every single one of us has investors, whether we own everything or not. Consumers renters, tenants, they're essentially investing in your idea by giving you money to fill your space. They're getting something in return for that. But if you don't treat those tenants and those folks the right way, they're not going to be there anymore. Right. And that's one way. And so if you own a company where you have investors or you have stock, you have investors. We all have investors. They come in different shapes and sizes. Yeah, I consider all of these guys are investors. That's right. And if you were giving them a bad product, this room would be empty. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And so we always have to have that respect, no matter what kind of business we are in, that we're serving a master that we may not necessarily think about that way. You know, uh, 
the real estate business was hit with a piece of news last week that's going to change the way commissions are paid to brokers and agents. And no matter how you look at it, it's going to impact the entire real estate community, especially the brokerage community. What advice do you have for, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically, you know, the, it used to be that the seller would pay the commission of the, of the broker that brought the deal and the broker who represented them. Now the ruling, or not the ruling, but the verdict that was passed was that uh, the seller is no longer responsible to pay the commission of the person who brought the buyer. That buyer is going to have to strike that agreement with the broker who brought them to the place, which is going to, you know, it's going to be chaotic a bit, and yeah. the commissions are going to be lowered. Basically, that pie is going to be lowered. What advice do you have? You, you're an expert. Yeah. In so I, 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 have, I have two issues with that. One is. You have people that don't have skin in the game changing the landscape of people that make their livelihood off of the buying and selling of property. So that's, that's number one. I think, I think number two, if you're going to dip into my pocket and change the way I feed my family, then we have to look at other regulations that are around that. And what I've been educated about is that a broker doesn't have the ability to sell other products and services and receive a commission for that. That's what I've been told. For me, what I wish existed is if you're going to change the landscape of the buy-sell side and you're going to change the way transactions are contemplated, then essentially a broker, an agent, becomes a representative of the consumer. And if I'm representing a consumer, the buyer or the seller, I should be able to represent them in a 360-degree way. And what I mean by that is if you look at the products and services that consumers need, to move into their home, you should be able to, through affinity marketing and affiliate marketing, be able to represent products and services that you believe make that homeowner's life better. I'll give you a good correlation. Uh, if you sell a car at a dealership, which is a single big asset, they don't tell the dealership that they're unable to sell that consumer the other benefits that they can buy in the finance office. If I represent somebody to buy a home or sell a home, I should have the same rights as an automobile dealer does when he sells that large asset. You are given the opportunity to monetize that relationship that I have fostered for four or five years. I've shown them 72 properties. I've done all this bullshit. I've listened to them at nine o'clock at night. And you're limiting my ability to make a living off of that relationship. And I've worked my ass off to establish that relationship. Stopping me from exploding the monetization of that relationship is offensive to me. The consumer will decide if they want to engage with you as their representative in getting a mortgage, getting insurance, getting all these other things. And I don't like that the regulation stops short of just holding back my ability to make money. I want you to go into your I got to get two more questions out. I know we're running over, but uh, you, you, you're a mentor to a lot of people and to a lot of different businesses. Who, who was your mentor when you started? I know, was Lee Iacocca somehow involved? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, um, you read a lot of books and see a lot of interviews where people are asked, who is your mentor? And my answer is always the same. I take my advice and my direction from the people that are on my team. And I hope that they mentor me to make better decisions that affect them. And I hope they have my best interest and the company's best interest at heart. I tend to try to keep my mentoring circle super tight. And the reason that I do is I never want to be influenced by people that may have a dog in the fight. I want people that are ultimately going to give me good advice. Recently being married after you know, being single for a while, I'd lost control of my checkbook. I lost control of my decision making, and I'm wealthier because of it. Yeah. All for the better. Yeah. Marcus, one last thing. Can you go into your profit skin and give the audience a piece of advice on their business? Yeah. My best advice for your business is you better know your numbers. And you've heard me say it before, and I love meeting business owners who don't understand what assets they have, what loans they have, how much cash they have, what their leverage is, what their cash flow is. Be a master of your information so that if you ever meet somebody when you least expect it and you want to sell them something, have them invest in you, have them lend money in you, 
the more confidence you have in your own information, the greater the conversion to success is going to be. Thank you so much. Got it. Thank you, Thank Marcus. You.